welcome everyone to Audiobooks from Hell. I am Sean DeRager, and today, very exciting, today we have uh, the person who's responsible for basically my naming of this podcast, who's responsible for uh, my obsession with old 80s paperbacks, and uh, he's also an author in his own right. Uh, Grady Hendrix joins us on the podcast today. Grady, thank you so much for joining me. It's a lot of responsibility, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. It is. I mean, you do have a lot of responsibility on your plate uh, as this whole paperbacks from hell thing has uh, kind of taken off a little bit. Um, yeah, it's 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 always <clears throat> a mixed a mixed set of feelings when people say, <laughs> oh, you made me start collecting these. And I think, <laughs> yes, I, I know what I live, what you will be in two years. And it's sad <laughs> yes. and debased. I'm, you know, I'm sitting in my office right now, uh, and it's like I had to find a book earlier to talk to to figure something out with someone, and I'm like digging through box after box <laughs> after box, and I'm thinking these could just fall over and crush the breath from my lungs yes. and kill me, and people would just feel sad when they read that obituary, and then they would buy more books. Well, we have to keep your yeah, memory alive. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man, I mean your uh, your book. Um, your, your book basically praising these, uh, paperbacks from hell came out. And of course you've been blogging about these, you've been reviewing these, you're an author in your own right. Um, so before we talk about, you know, the books you've written and, and everything else, you know, uh, what kind of, what began your fascination with these paperback books? I mean, for me, I'm a huge, I'm a child of the eighties. I, for me, horror was, uh, forbidden. I grew up in a very strong fundamentalist Christian home and, uh, you know, during the whole satanic panic, all that stuff. So anything horror, anything devils was strictly forbidden, which actually be began my fascination with horror. And I kind of all started with a Nightmare on Elm Street and, and movies like that. Um, I never as a kid got into the paperbacks because like a movie you can kind of sneak in, you can watch. Um, but books were a little bit different. I had to kind of smuggle some Stephen King in. Um, but I never got into the, the, all the books cause all I, I lived in Iowa. All I had was Stephen King was on, was, was the horror you get at the, got the library. Um, sure. so I'm a little bit late to the game, but I get it because of my fascination with the, the movies, old movie posters. Um, what kind of started your fascination with, with these books? I guess well, so, we'll start there. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the same boat, right? Like I was not allowed to see R rated movies as a kid. Absolutely out of the question. Um, and so what I would do is at, um, after Cub Scout meetings, which happened at our church, uh, we'd be taken to the gas station nearby where we could buy candy. And I convinced the scout masters that because magazines were reading, I was allowed <laughs> to buy Fangoria. And so <laughs> yes. okay. I would read Fangoria and pretend I'd seen the movies that I read about. Um, and I'd also <laughs> go to the spinner rack at my local drugstore and read those Marvel comic adaptations of movies like um, I, Alien was one I picked up at some point and stuff like that. And so I was like, I was pretending to have seen all these movies I'd never seen. And in fact, <laughs> like four years ago, I was like, oh, I'm going to watch Friday the 13th Part 2 again. And I started watching it and I was like. I've never seen this movie, but I read about it in Fango, and I convinced myself I'd lied so much. I convinced myself I'd seen it. And also, I was in the same boat. Like, there was, like, a paperback swap shop near our house, but, like, I would buy the sci-fi. I would buy the fantasy. I would buy the military men's adventure stuff, mm -hmm. you know, with lots of guns. But the horror books were too gross. Like, the covers really put me off and I knew I couldn't get away with them in my right, house. Like right. my, like Stephen King covers would be okay. They were pretty sedate, but like, uh -huh. you know, Graham Masterton and stuff like that. Clive <laughs> Bar that, that wouldn't fly. So I didn't really get into horror until later. I mean, I read King as a kid. I think everyone does. Yeah. Um, and you know, I went through flowers in the attic for the dirty parts and, and those sort of things. But, it wasn't until a lot later. And actually what really happened was um, I was writing and not really selling. And I was, but I was like, okay, horror seems to be where I am. And, and I liked horror. I didn't have anything against it. It was interesting. Um, but I'd be going to these paperback stores and seeing these vast aisles of 
books where I didn't know who's J.N. Williamson, you know, who's Joan Sampson, who's Elizabeth Ingstrom, who's Barry Wood? Like, why are there 500 copies of this book, The Tribe, here? Why are there 9,000 copies of the Exorcist no- of the Omen novelization? Um, and so I just started reading them randomly. And Tor, the publisher, has a website, Tor.com, and they would pay like 50 bucks for a post. And so I was like, well, I need money. So I would just start reading these and writing about them. And, um, you know, you start feeling out the territory and seeing what's out there. And at a certain point, my editor at Quirk, because by now I'd, I'd sold Horror Store mm-hmm. and um, had written My Best Friend's Exorcism. And uh, my editor's like, hey, these things you write for Tor, like, do you want to pitch us on a book of those? He's like, I don't think we'd buy it actually. Like it's, I don't, I don't see how it hang together, but I'd read it. And, and so I did and they bought it and then I had to figure out how it hung together, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, it was very random. It was a very random process. <laughs> I mean, when I saw it is what quirk books, quirk was the ones who released the paperbacks from hell. Um, correct. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to get him confused with Valancourt because that's, that's a whole other monster we'll talk about. Oh, later. right. Yeah. Yeah. When I saw the book, the ad for the book, or that it was coming out, me and all my horror buddies were just like, "Oh my god! Like, why haven't we thought about this?" You know, <laughs> like, because uh, that's the, what blew me away. Why hadn't anyone done it before? Exactly. Because the the '80s posters, the horror posters, were always fantastic, and I'm always one that's like praising the painted poster art of these movies and I love collecting those. I I have books of VHS covers and stuff like that. And so when I saw this, I was like, this makes so much sense, but why haven't, why don't I have half of these on my shelves? I had a couple of them, but I'm like, um, and then, so it just opened up, you know, it opened things up, whole new world opened up. And then I started narrating audiobooks, and I'm like, well, if I'm going to narrate an audio book, I'm making, I'm going to try to find some of these to narrate. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So this uh, it just, it, it's gone to the next level here because I've been doing stuff with Psychopocalypse Publications, who they have a few. I've done, I've done uh, uh, something for Valancourt, and I mean, there's, now that I've been Which reading ones them, did you do for Valancourt? I did Out for Blood. It's not technically a part of their line because oh, sure, sure. I think that they a, they signed it before a, they did that. But it's te- yeah, they I mean, did, it, and early '90s, right? Like 90s, yeah, it's like '91. Like, mm-hmm. It's funny. That's a book that's like it's not, you know, I actually enjoy that book, but it's one mm-hmm. of those things where reading it, I'm like, oh, I've been to those clubs. Like, <laughs> like I've been to the, like that weird small town that has like one banging gay club where everyone goes because the uh-huh. DJ is great and they've got a light <laughs> system. Like, you know what I mean? In like the early nineties, it was just like, it was so spot on with that aspect of mm-hmm. it. I kind of love it. Yeah. No, that was a fun one to narrate. And, and the first one I did that kind of, you know, um, that gave me the taste was, uh, I did the brain eaters by, by, uh, by, uh, Gary, Gary Brandner. Oh yeah. Which and I've that, never read. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a pandemic novel. It's a pandemic, oh, uh, zombie I type think. novel, not necessarily I zombies, think. but it's timely. It's very timely. Um, but that was a fun one. And, but what I love about the eighties in particular, I think with horror is just the, they're on a, the unabashed approach to just, Grew, uh, just being gruesome and I don't know and just not letting I don't know just letting the characters be it's a this character is an asshole yeah he's 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 masochistic yeah. he's whatever uh that's his character he's lead and, and and he's the lead character and he's the chain smoker here you go <laughs> you know this is the guy you're yeah. following yeah and it's a thing with the the time period where it was a buyer's market or right I guess a seller's market I always get those mm, confused mm. but in the sense that a midlist book could do such good numbers that mm-hmm. editors really had more of a hands-off attitude. There wasn't the idea that we've got to shape you into this hit. There was an idea of, okay, this is a, you know, this is gay vampire semi-erotica. <laughs> sure, let's see if there's an audience. Because right. the numbers would at least be 50,000, 60,000, 70,000. They do enough to justify their 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 investment. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, everything didn't have to be a big hit. There could be some, some, you know, doubles. <laughs> I mean, what, what was it? The stories that uh, got you, or what was the first thing that snagged you? Was it the the artwork? I mean, there's so much out oh, there, and like, and, and yeah. like I said, like like I said, it, 
it became this horror boom and it was just everywhere. And I feel like, cause I've been kind of digging for certain rights for certain novels to either bring to, to bring to audiobook, but I, but I want to use the original artwork. Some of the artwork right. I can't, I cannot find the artist. So I feel like they just had people, uh, skulls and demons just slapping posters together and whipping stuff out. Was it, do you, was it in the research you've done? Was it, you've done, was it that sort of, uh, just like rabid thing to get these things out there? Or was that? Well, I mean, everything <clears throat> felt like a book, right? Until sort of towards the end in, I think the nineties, it all felt like books. So like, you know, they had relationships with artists. They do sketches. The art mm -hmm. director was involved. It was a, it was a much more sedate process than mm -hmm. I thought it would, would be. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for any art, email me because I know a lot of these guys <laughs> and they can always like they're always happy to like, oh, that's not me, but that's so and so that's Richard Newton or something. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing that I really thought was kind of crazy about a lot of these books is sort of um, how much thought was behind them. You know, they wouldn't mm -hmm. mess with the writer. They wouldn't say, oh, you have to make your vampire more sympathetic or, you know, you can't have killer puppies because killer mermaids are what everyone's into right now. <laughs> but they would really work them through the story. They'd have the art director come in. You know, they they really spent a lot of time on this. And, and what hooked me was a cover. I mean, really what, what sort of flipped my switch was this Hector mm -hmm. Garrido cover for the little people by, uh, John Christopher, <laughs> yeah, uh, with the Nazi leprechauns. <laughs> yes. Um, and you look at the hardback cover for that by, um, Paul Bacon, I think, who is this really classy cover artist, but literally the hardback cover is a completely white cover with this tiny little foot in a <laughs> pointy toed shoe slipping off the side. And, I look at that and I think you can read a manuscript for a book about Nazi leprechauns and literally just draw one shoe. I admire your restraint, sir. <laughs> I am in awe of what you were able to do there. Um, Hector Garrido went batshit crazy and he's got this Irish castle on the paperback cover, busting open like a pinata, disgorging a veritable Reich full of, uh, I assume that's the number for, that's the right word for a large number of Nazi leprechauns. <laughs> I think it right is. Of, yeah, of Nazi leprechauns. And like, it's amazing. Um, but then you start reading these things and what really got me was no one was reading them. Like, you can feel that you're in this sort of abandoned space mm -hmm. and it's kind of amazing. Like, like Out for Blood, when I read the reprint of that from Valancourt, I was like, this is unique. Like if I grabbed this off a paperback yeah. rack in 1991, I, this would have spoken to me in a really like personal way. And there wasn't anything else like it out there. I mean, there was Poppy Bright, but like her stuff was so much gorier and less friendly. And like, mm -hmm. you know, this these books, they're books. Someone put a piece of their life into them and they're just yeah. sort of the lights are off. No one's home. The doors are open. You can just walk in and look around. And it's, it's crazy to me that no, not more people do that. Yeah. I, I've seen it. I mean, I have seen a shift in, um, in, in horror fiction. Um, just since I've am aware of all this, um, even how they're marketed. Like I just saw a YouTube video where there's, you know, kind of comparing the older paperback uh, or, or the how how horror novels were marketed, you know, in the eighties and nineties, and then today you you'll see like a Stephen King, and it looks just it doesn't look like a horror novel, you know, from the yeah from it, all the books now, and it's the same thing with movie posters. There's like a formula; everything looks is very much the same. You can easily like I don't even know what's new uh, if I'm browsing a shelf, you know, a anymore or interesting. I have yeah. no idea what the book's about, and uh, I think that's what I love about about the artwork, especially for, for these ones. And, and, but I see a lot of, you know, modern, modern books, especially kind of in the horror genre, a lot of authors get it and they're trying to bring back this kind of aesthetic. I mean, you did with my best friend's exorcism with the, uh, the VHS sure. inspired artwork for the, for the cover, which is, which is wonderful. Um, so yeah. And that's, and that's really, I won't, I mean, that's, so what happened with that was, 
the hardcover I loved and I had so much input into the cover and we wanted it to look like a, a prestigious kind of eighties book, you know, and, um, we wanted to look like a yearbook and it sold okay, but not great. And then Doogie Horner, who had been the art director at Quirk, who had, who had left to do something else, who came back, came in just when the paperback was getting ready and they were going to go with the same hardcover cover art. And Doogie was like, no, he's like, you, this has to look like a V this needs to look like an eighties <laughs> movie. And there was no time to do it. There was like, seven weeks i think and he really insisted and he managed to find and everyone was saying this wasn't the right idea and he managed to find this artist hugh woolley i believe um no um oh god um i'm getting his name wrong he's done a bunch of star wars trading cards he's a commercial artist okay. in australia and hugh said um you know I'll do this, but there's not a lot of time. So I will give you one sketch. You have one sketch. And after that, it's done. I will turn in the art <laughs> and I'm not making revisions because these oh things God. go back and forth. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? He was like oh, yeah. one and done. Um, and Doogie was like, great. And he turned in that the a sketch and, and we gave him some notes. So there were just a few things that weren't quite on on accurate for the book. Right. And then he turned in that finished painting and it's gorgeous. And yeah. like. That's all that is literally someone going above and beyond their job to say, I'm going to take a risk. And if it messes up, it's on me. And <laughs> like it's it was really that doesn't happen a lot in publishing. Yeah. Um, you know, Quirk has a I can't give too many. Uh, I shouldn't even tell the story, but Quirk <laughs> has a notorious incident where they had a book where they wanted cover art. The editor wanted cover art for this book that didn't look like what else is on the market. Mm -hmm. And Barnes and Noble's buyers said, no, they said, we want this to look like the other stuff. Otherwise, it sticks out like a sore thumb. It looks bad. And so Quirk <laughs> said, fine, we will publish this book without a single copy being sold to Barnes and Noble. And this was in the early 2000s when Barnes and Noble was a much bigger player. And the book became this huge hit. And then eventually Barnes and Noble came on board. But I'm like, the intestinal fortitude you know, to go out there and say, fine, you would normally buy 50 or 60,000 copies of this or however many, but you're going to buy zero. We're good with that because this is the right cover. Like, that's really rare. I mean, books are an industrial process and there's a way things go. And so when someone pushes back against it, it's really it's really something kind of, uh, you know, unique. It does seem that that lately the uh the publishing game does seem to be changing um, a little bit, I, I guess. With more, there's more power to the independent pub, independent publishing companies, uh, authors. Um, have you seen a shit? Like, I, let's 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 go back a little bit. When did you start? When were you first published? When was your first book published? So I have sort of a weird publishing history. I <laughs> did early on, God knows how long ago. Um, a friend of mine was writing some YA and. Um, she sort of wanted some help with it. And so she brought me in. So I co-wrote some YA novels with her a long time ago as like my best friend from high school. And, um, and around the same time, my wife got a, um, who's a chef, she got a contract to write a cookbook and she had wanted to do this graphic novel cookbook. So she and I wrote that together and I, liked both processes i guess that's the plural um <laughs> but it was really frustrating to have to sort of navigate everyone's interest and desires and wants and needs and so mm. around the same time i started writing some books that i was just self-publishing on like amazon um and then about a year after that i kind of stumbled into the horror store deal so 2014 i think was when i signed the horror store contract but i'd written some books before then but they were books with other people they were books that were self published like you know it was um so it's been like it's probably been 5 years since i've been supporting myself doing this and you know six years since I've been doing this on some kind of professional basis, I guess. But I was a journalist for like 10 years before that. So yeah, this is sort of all I know how to do. Like if books <laughs> run out, like I'm screwed. I know, huh? Yeah. yeah. What is your, uh, what is your, um, since this technically is an audiobook podcast, but um, 
What has your, and I think most of these have been put onto audiobook. What is, have you been brought into the process or has like a publisher kind of just done it? What's your kind of. Well, so, okay. So I have a weird, <laughs> yeah, I have a weird relationship with audiobooks, Um, and I'll get to the weirder part in a <laughs> second, but with horror store, I had no input. I mean, I was a nobody. Um, and, and still am pretty much a nobody, <laughs> but, um, but they did this great thing where Bronson Pinchot did part of the audiobook, and that was really cool, sold a lot. And um, and so after that, I started getting some narrator selection. But it wasn't until I did this book called We Sold Our Souls in like 2018, I think, um, that I sort of started like putting my foot down because they were coming to me with these audiobook narrators who – were great. They were great readers. They had good voices. They nothing was wrong with them at all. But we sold our souls as a book about a woman in her forties who's been in a heavy metal band, whose life is washed up, who lives in rural New uh, Pennsylvania, who you know is kind of this badass. And they're bringing me, you know, readers who are in their twenties and their thirties with these really great, very juicy, very, um, very rounded voices, you know, like with real, like, I mean, they sounded like their vocal cords were made of gold and honey. And, <laughs> and I really like was irritating the, the producers who were Blackstones. I was, I was like, okay, I, yeah. this isn't right. This isn't right. And they're like, oh my God. And they're going through. And finally they came up with this person. They said to us, Carol Monda. And oh my God, it sounded like she basically just ate like an ashtray for breakfast. Like, yes. and and I don't know Carol personally, but from what I understand, she's in her forties and she's just, it sounds like she just like chews on cigarette butts and she had a <laughs> great voice for this. And I was like, that's the person. And they're like, really? And I'm not, I, audiobooks aren't my thing. Like I just, I get uh -huh. too distracted, but like I listened to some of that when I was like, God, you know, Viacon Diaz, she has done such an amazing <laughs> job. It was so nice to send that into the world. And so, and then we really, you know, did the same thing for the reader for the book that's coming up, which hasn't been announced yet. The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slain Vampires, which is out next week, but they haven't announced the audio book yet, which I'm waiting for them to announce. Oh, no, I, I, got, it, I got it right here. It's, oh, it's, up on, it's up on the site. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, narrated by uh, Bah Bahni Turpin. I, yeah. I'm probably going to butcher that name, but, yeah. but that's but fantastic. She is um, – it was really hard with this one uh, because it's Southern and a lot of the characters uh -huh. are Southern and you don't want someone doing a fake Southern accent. She's from the <laughs> South and um, I really loved – and like she has – a great Southern voice without being obnoxious, right? It doesn't sound like you're listening to like Designing Women or Della Reese or someone. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it's not this like crazy Southern accent, but it's Southern enough to work. And she's African American, which was important to me because um, it's like, I love the sort of dichotomy between people looking at that little picture they get on the back of their reader and then listening to their voice, which is, She's just Southern. Um, and and for, from being from South Carolina, that that means something to me. Um, yeah, yeah. No, but my weird thing with audiobooks is I'm, I get too distracted to listen to them because it's a big time commitment and I don't want to reread my own stuff anyways. But when I went to university, I, um, one of, I, I went to this weird program in New York, which was like, you sort of designed what you wanted to study. And one of the things I was really into was audio engineering. And so they had this dude teaching my classes for like three years who was out of the BBC drama workshop and, you know, did the, the, the experimental radio lab over there. And he was big on radio drama and all this stuff. And like just crazy, hardcore, intense radio drama. And everything we learned on was Otari quarter inch reel to reel machines. So you're sitting there wow, with yeah. laser blade, like editing with tape and magnetic <laughs> tape and all this stuff. And that's how I learned audio for years. And wow. I remember going in to turn, like you have to, when you graduate, the week you graduate, you have to, um, basically go to the cage where you rent equipment. Cause I was doing location sound on movies. So I was doing like with a Nagra reel to reel and all that and, um, converting stuff to mag stock. And I had to go in to, to, to strike off my signing privileges and all that. 
And they're taking out all the reel-to-reel machines. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? Are you all moving to another floor? And they're like, oh, no, <laughs> we're going all digital. I was like, what? Oh <laughs> no one taught me any of this oh digital God. magic. I spent like three years learning analog audio <sighs> mixing, and it's all worthless. Like, it is literally <laughs> worthless. If you see a Nagra anywhere now, it's a prop. You know, it's like like yeah. overnight, everything I learned was just useless. Oh, my God. So I love it. I hate it. I It <laughs> huddles me. It hurts me. Uh, that's that's kind of like how it was with me, and because I had a radio a, a broadcasting uh, degree, and uh, the year I graduated, Clear Channel bought up everybody and laid off everybody. And, uh, there's no like zero jobs. <laughs> like they're having everyone work remotely. Uh, they're having one DJ for like five, ten stations. You know. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so. so wait, yeah. one DJ for ten. So that's like the way they do with projectionists now, where it's one projectionist for like eight different theater, like. Eight different yeah, you know, programs. That's bonkers. Yeah, because you have like a guy. I mean, now you, you basically have a guy working out of his house for the, for the most part. I'm sure there's other things now, but I mean, um, you know, it, it, he'll he'll do like the, you know, morning show on this station for this state, drive home thing for this state at this yeah. time, pre record them all. I mean, I, I had a little bit of a radio gig at a country station and I would do the, do the overnight shift and I would go in, I would record all my breaks in an hour for the whole night. Um, and then take calls, take requests from truckers at like 2 AM, um, <laughs> get go live if I had to. But otherwise, man, I just, I just sat around and listened to music. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. You know, it's, bon you know, it's crazy. I guess I worked at my college radio station and like, I was, uh, I think, midnight to 3 a.m. It was great. I loved it. Um, yeah. It was so, and, you know, it's funny. I spent like a summer, a little more than that, living in my car one year and um, in the early 90s. And mm -hmm. I listened to the radio all the time. You know, you'd be, I'd be driving around and like gas was cheap. And so, and it was right around the time when everything was getting super syndicated, but you still on AM had a lot of like wild and woolly stuff and FM wasn't totally syndicated yet. And you'd be driving from market to market and you'd be listening to these shows switch over and you, you had a lot of Rush Limbaugh. You had a lot of these sort of like local conservative guys because that was taken off. But you also had like Art Bell, Coast to Coast. I don't know if mm -hmm. you remember that at all. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I love Coast to Coast. Yeah, and like there was just – and, you know, you get like churches that would have weird – like, you know, they'd have a ta antenna with like uh, like 30-mile range that you drive through. And there was something really amazing about – and this is going to sound so corny, but like just sort of <laughs> driving around America and just listening to all these voices late at night and just mm -hmm. how local some were and how some were very national. And then you get into local again and you'd hear the local guys imitating the national guys or the local guys doing something so off the reservation. It was, you know, I mean, it was just there was something really beautiful about it and very, mm -hmm. I don't know, it felt very American and. I lived in LA for a while and like I'd always be I started catching I don't know if you remember Joe Frank at all. Uh I I do not. I'm I I do not. I probably wasn't around here around that time. Sure. But like this was I was this was early 90s mid 90s I guess by then mm -hmm. and I didn't know who Joe Frank was but I started catching this weird crazy dude on my car. It's like is this real? Is this a put on? What <laughs> what's this guy talking about? Uh like matadors and like, you know, violent charades and I don't understand. <laughs> and there was just, I don't know. Radio was an amazing thing and podcasts podcasts are great, but there's an intentionality to them. Radio was nice because yeah. it was random. Random and, and unpredictable. Yeah. You know, in, in in a sense, you know, um yeah, and no, something I, so intimate about it because you couldn't change it. Like you just took the yeah, cane. It's bizarre how things have have changed and become more processed and everything. And but that I mean that's why I'm I'm glad there's a lot of um I feel like I feel like for, for all the crap there is out there in the in the publishing world, um in, in books and in, in fiction, 
you know, the, the, the YA stuff, um, the post-apocalyptic, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of generic stuff kind of put out there. There's still a lot of really fun, very original, um, books being put out there and, you know, still catching people's eyes, Yeah, you know, and that's, that's what I, I, I love that that's happening in the, in the horror, you know, film world. It's the same kind of thing. There's, there's, I feel like horror especially has kind of retained that sense of discovery and independence, um, even with all the, the big budget things that are around it. It still, for some reason, is that genre that still kind of can, you know, toe the line and kind of push boundaries still, you know, and that's, that's why I've always loved the genre and still, still love it to this day. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that that, that, that aspect has, hasn't really changed as much. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about publishing. I mean, there are a lot of books out there. If you have a very specific interest, you can find it. Um, yeah. you really like vampire erotica. There's vampire erotica out there. You really, really like post-apocalyptic teenagers in party dresses. That's out there for you. Like, <laughs> okay. and one of the nice things about books, even more than that, is it's it's a really perfect technology. Like, it doesn't go obsolete. Um, mm-hmm. So if you like something even weirder, like you want to read, you know, killer dog fiction from England in the 70s and just get a lot of brown corduroy kind of feels in your life, um, <laughs> yes. just you can go online and find it. You can order it. Yeah. You know, it's a couple of bucks. Um so that's one of the nice things about publishing. And and yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the nice things about horror is I feel like trends come and go with horror, but mm-hmm. more than almost, I think, well, genre more than sort of like literary fiction, which is a genre, but I don't want to get into that yeah. thing. Like <laughs> genre fiction has these evergreen things like you read a Western from 1949 and you read a Western from 1960 they're still going to be plowing the same field. You know, if you read a romance mm-hmm. novel from the 60s and the 90s, there's going to be some differences, but a lot of similarities. And the same with horror. There's going to be mm-hmm. vampire fiction from the 40s. There's going to be vampire fiction from the 2000s. And it's fun to see the changes. And it's really comforting to see the similarities. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when did Valancourt approach you about kind of you know, put it, creating this paperbacks from hell line of books. Did they, I mean, uh, who owned the, the title paperbacks from hell? Was that you? Was that quirk? Like what was, how did that yeah, relationship well that's, start? Yeah. That's something I have to work out with quirk at the time. And, <laughs> um, and so what happened with Valancourt was, uh, Jane just emailed me out of nowhere. And, uh, was like, oh, you know, and he asked me to write a few intros for some other books. And I think that mm-hmm. was sort of some camouflage to ask if we wanted to do a paper Axon Hell reprint line. Um, and then he brought that up because the intros went well. They were fun to do. And um, there were some contract things to work out with Quirk. And mm-hmm. uh, Quirk's very happy with the deal that got made. And um, I don't see any money from it. I mean, I'm I'm literally it is it is between Quirk and Valancourt. But OK, uh, gotcha. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm writing the intros and helping Jay find the books and all that stuff. And he's really done yeoman's duty man it's the Mm. stuff he goes through to put these books out it's crazy i mean the thing that's really nice he wants to make sure the cover artists get paid and licensed appropriately that the author gets royalties and everything they deserve and Mm. the stuff he has to go through to find the rights i mean oh man i i did that with a book series called silver glass that had a pseudonym of uh, two women yeah and uh well, was it horror or fantasy or uh it was fantasy it was like a female conan the conan a female conan basically it's called oh, silver wow. glass from when the 70s or uh 80s okay 80s like 85 86 yeah um the cover art was you know big busty blonde <laughs> with a gigantic sword you know sure i was like well well the the cover artist was asking way too much and i was like that was probably a good one to redo a cover though even yeah. though i mean you, you know what you're that. getting i guess but 
But I guess the, the, the subject matter, they're a little more progressive for their time. Strong women characters. They're not just these... It's not just a big-breasted woman with a sword. It's like, it's a lot of empowerment there. So I was like, okay, well, but tra tracking down uh, rights and names and people is, is I, I did, for this one series, I did it. And I was like, I don't, I don't know if I could do this again. Yeah. And if people like James, you know, doing that and, I mean. Yeah, there will not be a third wave of the paperback from Held Books just because the second wave, man, <laughs> it really took it out of us. Like. We all have to agree, like Will Erickson, who does too much horror fiction, who wrote Paperbacks from Hell with me, and James mm -hmm. and I and and Ryan, who also works at Valancourt, we all sort of have to agree a book's worth doing and that we're excited yeah. about. And then we have to be able to do it uh, with rights. And man, we had two, eh, three real books for this the second wave of Paperbacks from Hell that we were all so psyched about and they washed out for the stupidest reasons. Um, <sighs> you know, and it was a real, a real trek to track down the rights. And, and one rights holder was just like, yeah, I'm not going to bother. The money's not good enough for me. Right. right. You don't have to do anything. Literally all you have to do is sign this thing. We're going to email you and send it back. And they're like, yeah, not worth yeah. it. And then the other one was <laughs> we, you know, James spent way too long on this book. I mean, uh, more power to him, but all that had to happen was that the nephew who was in his 80s of the original author had to sign some paperwork and send it back to New York. But he was in Australia and he was 85. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and you know, it was just, it was a bridge too far. And, Ugh. you know, it was just so demoralizing. <laughs> Because, you know, yeah, one of we, these, I mean, you want to bring these books back into print. Like, you want people to get excited about these authors. You want them to get totally. excited about these books. And, like, uh, uh, anyway. I had a um, I had a book. I can't remember the guy's name. The book is called Blood Farm. By, oh, my um, God. I just read Blood Farm. The vampire uh, book in Iowa. Sam, yeah. Sam yeah. Simo, um, uh, Siciliano. Yes. yes. So, I contacted him. No, to really? possibly like? bring it. He's very nice. Um, I can I because I was like, hey, you know, we would love to help because I was working with Psych Apocalypse Publications to because he he does the same thing, you know, with contracts and all that stuff. Sure. Um, and I was like, well, we ha we can bring this. You don't have to do anything. We would love to bring this to audiobook and back into print. And he replied back very polite and said, you know, you know, I'm kind of a different person now. I'm kind of ashamed at all the sex and violence that I put in that what? book. And and he's like, so I'm going to pass. And I was like, no, but the, book, uh, the book's so good. <laughs> it's That's a really fun book. Like, yeah. and also, like, yeah, there are some long Gothic, sex man. scenes in that book. <laughs> There's like three really long uh, sex scenes in there, and it's a little violent, but like it's a pretty yeah. straightforward Dracula in Iowa book. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, man, so, what so a stuff bummer. like that, you know? Yeah, I mean these these books. There's just so many books out there. There's so much. I mean, gold in these hills, and 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 not necessarily like. I understand things have to make financial sense, and I've I've run into that and. You know, I think right now, you know, we're right now I'm with the projects that I have lined up for audiobooks. It's kind of let me just get my name out there as someone who likes to do these. And, you know, hopefully in the next few years, things will pan out financially because I, I do this on the side right now. And, uh, but so, but I, I can understand like how frustrating it is that all these books are just kind of going to sit there. And maybe never be rediscovered, you know, yeah. just lost on these degrading paperbacks. There's one called uh, The Mime that I just got. The cover's oh, the amazing. Mime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great Oh, my God. Cover. The cover's incredible. And I can't track down anything on that one. Um, but it's it's hard to find those ones. And the ones you find are just beat to shit yeah. um, so far. But, uh, yeah, every, but man, mime, every copy of The cover. Mime I've ever seen, I don't know what it is about that book. It looks like someone's been <laughs> punching it. Yes, every single one. It's There's incredible. a great book called The Troop, and I can't remember the author right now. Did you read the mime yet? Not yet. I just got it yesterday. So it's a really mail. fun cover. I wish it was more mime. 
Um, it's, <laughs> read it because you might like it more than I did. But the okay. troop, I feel like, is the book that the mime wanted to be. Um, gotcha. You know, T R O U P. Um, I can't remember the author, but if you can find a copy of that, you should look into it because <laughs> that one's a blast. Like mime's good. Nothing against the mime. I have no problem uh -huh. with mimes. It's a beautiful long uh lasting with a beautiful history uh art form my means terrific but the <laughs> troop is really some like Times square new york city mime break dancing on the street crazy horror shit yes 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 awesome so do you ever think about doing full cast recordings and stuff or is that stuff sort I've, of out i've auditioned for some um i'm still i'm a year and a half into this and uh so i have you know, I have my day job. It's a really good job. I got good benefits. Like right now, a lot of people are out of work. I am not. Sure. So I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Um, but this is something that I want to eventually retire into would mm -hmm. be great. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've auditioned for a few full cast things. I'm still very, need to be very picky with what I audition for and try not to overbite, which I tend to do. I tend to bite off way more than I can chew. Sure. Um, because I have, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i going to do all eight of William Scholl's books. Um, no, all eight of them? Hold yeah, all eight of them. I go, I, I like this one book. He goes, you want to do all of them? I'm like, okay. Oh, my God. So, like, Bri Bride of Satan's one of his, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my Which God. It's, and, uh, uh, the original. Uh, the, the, he, Saurian? He, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. And those are ones where I was trying to track down the artists, um, and I they were all uncredited. Yeah, I can't um, we, you out. and I talked about those. Yeah, so we're uh, we we just we just pulled the trigger and was like, we're gonna incorporate the art. It's not one hundred percent the art, but we're incorporating because on two of the books he wanted to revert to his original titles. Oh, which what, what, what? If, yeah, um, um, Bride of Satan is actually called Vicious, which Bride of Satan is such a better title. Yeah, Bride of um, better. <clears throat> and then um, there's one other one I can't remember the name shivers not shivers not shivers um there's one other one with a shorter title that's the new title was things that go bump in the dark and i was like um i was like people mm -hmm. are not gonna know what they are if we have to change the cover we for yeah. those i was like for those two sp specifically we need to try to incorporate those old covers because when someone sees that they'll go oh okay this is what it is so yeah. hopefully it all works out but yeah no i i, I bite off more than i can chew and i, I gotta no. So wait, but, um, two questions. Didn't he do a Countess Bathory book? I don't set in the uh, Midwest. That's I don't like think uh, so. maybe I'm wrong. I might be wrong. Okay. Um, but the yeah. other thing is, so wait, all eight William Scholl books. How many hours is that? I I haven't added it up yet because <laughs> they're thicker books. Yeah, they're like, like three hundred pages books. at least. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, you know, we'll we'll see that. You know, narrating a book is like. You know, it's, it's eating an elephant one bite at a time. You know, it's just, you just got to just chip away at them. And most of the time they take longer, especially if you're doing a part time, they take way longer than you anticipate them to do. And it gets frustrating. And cause I tell my wife, oh, I'm going to do a couple chapters tonight. She, all right, cool. So she puts on like the bachelor or something and I go into work and, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna knock out two chapters. Like I'm in there for like three hours and I have like one chapter done. You yeah. Know, I'm, I'm beat down and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> I want a two done. I was going to um, say there but, must you know. come a point in the middle of recording these books when you just feel lost. Like you're so far from the beginning <laughs> that you can't go back and you're so far from the end. Like it must be crazy. You just got to trudge forward. Uh, it's going to just trudge forward on it. Man. So so my goal has been to try to choose titles that I would just love to read. And most of the time that works, sometimes it's like, God damn, this book's a slog. It's like, why this book <laughs> sounded awesome? Why am I slogging through this? So it, it is what it is. Um, yeah, so we got to start amazing. wrapping up okay. here yep. soon. But uh, um, and you and I can probably go into a ton of rabbit trails here for sure. Oh, yeah. Because um, we're just those type of people. Um, so when you're back to paperbacks from hell, when you're compiling that, is there in, in all the books you've read, um, what are some... If you off the top of your head, and I know it's always putting you on the spot, but what are some, a, a few titles that you think were not given the chance, you know, that, that you discovered, people probably didn't discover at the time, which ones could you recommend to people who are just kind of jumping into these saying, hey, these are kind of the essential 
paperbacks from hell you need to grab. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm going to name stuff that's more available now just because okay. I want people to be able to read it. One yes. book that I read recently that really blew me away is I – mean, have you ever read Whitley Strieber's uh, The Hunger? I haven't read the book. I've seen the movie. Everyone knows I, I, the movie. The movie's fine. Everyone knows Nothing the movie. wrong with the movie. Right. There's great stuff in the movie. The book is amazing. I mean, it's one awesome. of the great vampire books. It's so dark and so – just despairing and and really such a radically different take on vampires and it's got your 80s kind of bs over the top craziness in it <laughs> but like it it really blew me away and i'd always underestimated it because in my mind well it's the movie and whitley streber kind of went bonkers with all his ufo stuff and <laughs> um Oh, man, it's an amazing book. Um, and awesome. Streber's always been kind of a reliable author. I mean, he wrote um, Night Church, which is okay. this weird book about like the Catholic Church is at war with this secret cult of heretics who are trying to breed the like Antichrist. But the Antichrist is just a, they just want to make an evolutionary offshoot of humanity, sort of like the next step in evolution so that we all wind up in a genetic dead end. It's of course. Yeah. Why not? Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I just. That but one's on like, the way. That's that's in the mail right now. Actually, yeah. I'm looking at the cover. Oh yeah, it's a great cover too. Um, <laughs> but it's actually a better book than you think it's going to be. It's not great, but it's nice. better than you think it's going to be. Um, <laughs> but you know, for me, like um, the books that really blew my mind, Elizabeth Ingstrom's "When Darkness Loves Us," which Valancourt put out. Mm -hmm. It's two novellas because really, "When Darkness Loves Us" is the first one, and "Beauty Is" is the second. But each one's like 170 pages. So they put them together. Each one is so insanely different and so gorgeous. I mean, When Darkness Loves Us is one of the grottiest, grimiest monster books I've ever read. And Beauty Is is just this, it's basically flowers for Algernon, but <laughs> the horror version with, you know, someone with no nose. Uh, and it's really incredible. Uh, and then she did a book called Black Ambrosia that was her vampire book mm -hmm. that I liked, but I didn't love. And then when I was talking to her about it, she's like, well, honey, you realize she's not really a vampire. She's just crazy. And I was like, oh, my God, this book's so good all of a sudden. <laughs> like, and so in the Valancourt reissue, they did a Black Ambrosia. The introduction is about how it's not – she's not actually – and it makes such a world of difference. I took it way too literally. Um, one book that I always saw in every single paperback swap shop was this black cover – not a very attractive cover for this book called The Tribe by The Tribe by Barry Wood. And mm -hmm. uh, I finally read it and it's great. I mean, it's probably the key work of like Jewish horror in the 20th century. It's about a bunch of Holocaust survivors in New York City in the 80s who bring a golem back to do some stuff. But it's, you know, I feel like books today they 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 tend towards the interior you know it's more about my my emotional processes it's i'm mm -hmm. dealing with these and this is a throwback to sort of the sprawling big giant you know 1980s book with lots of characters and lots of subplots and lots of people and lots of locations and it feels epic and it's if you're mm -hmm. a fan of that kind of like new york city in the 70s and 80s vibe and a, just that sort of big, sprawling, epic novel. The Tribe is really amazing. Um, and what broke my heart, I, I did an interview with Barry um, to write the introduction for the Valancourt reissue, and she hates it. She thinks it's a terrible oh, no. book. Yeah, and it was like, I, I couldn't get her to see how good it was. Um, she just like denounced it completely. It was it was a real wow. bummer. Wow. And the weirdest, oh, the weirdest thing about that book is the X Files actually lifted it completely uncredited for an ish, an episode in I think season three, uh, called Kaddish. Um, but oh. they literally lift that book wholesale. And and at the time it was out of print and it was in used bookstores and the rights were unavailable. And I think mm. someone just read it and thought it was a great story and used it. I mean, you know, okay, it happens. Would have been nice if they <laughs> paid the author, but. Um, and then uh, in terms of sort of like batshit crazy stuff, so 
I just read this book by John Shirley, who, you know, John Shirley went on to be this very accomplished cyberpunk author. And people really, you know, he wrote a great horror novel called Sellers. It's pretty well known. But the first book he ever wrote, and the second book that he ever published, he wrote it when he was like 19 or 20, is called Dracula in Love. And I've got a vampire book coming out, so I'm a little obsessed with vampires right now. <laughs> Dracula in Love is it's like 205 pages. It's pretty small. It is really crazy, like jaw-droppingly crazy. Like, to give you a hint of just how bonkers it, I mean, this, and I tell you this with complete sincerity, because I tend to overhype books. This is the <laughs> tip of the iceberg. In this book, Dracula's penis is three feet tall moves independently of Dracula and has two glowing yellow eyes. <laughs> and that is That's probably incredible. the least crazy thing about this book. And <laughs> it's from 1979 or 80 zebra, which is uh -huh. sort of that bottom of the barrel publisher put it out. Oh, I think because no one else would touch it. God it's bless amazing. zebra, man. <laughs> yeah. Bless their hearts. I find some really great stuff from them. And I think I'm actually, I'm doing a couple of uh, Gary Brandner's. Um, oh yeah, the 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 brain, the big brain. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll be doing those. Those are on the docket to do at some point. Uh -huh. you know. Man, you know the thing with Zebra is, for every four crappy Zebra novels you read, read <laughs> there's one genius one. You know, it's just like yeah. it's like playing Russian roulette with a loaded gun. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. you lose more than you win, but when you win, it feels so good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, these these books are bonkers. I mean, the, the artwork has nothing to do with the books. And in fact, I just found this out. <clears throat> so there's three books credited to Gary Brandner for these, for the okay. Big Brain series. Um, so we we're getting all the contracts all set with his with um, with his widow. And um, so we're all good to go. We got the books because we get, you know, in Psychopoc, just like Valancourt, they have to transcribe you know these these books right so these aren't scanned anywhere so they have to either destroy them and just like destroy them and scan them basically you know cut yeah, the spines yeah. off and scan them um or you know hand transcribe which uh which mark from a psycho apocalypse is doing to one of the books one of the, some one of those oh my books. god are you kidding ridiculous because he oh. it's such a rare book he doesn't want to uh destroy it so <laughs> Jeez. So anyway, so so there's these three big brain books, and I'm on I'm on deck to narrate the three at some point, and I get an email that's going, "Hey, but let's take the third book off of the calendar." And I go, "Why?" He goes, "Well, I just found out that Brander didn't even write that. They just slapped his name on it. They what? had a ghostwriter, and they slapped his name on the third book." Holy cow! <laughs> zebra. <laughs> God, I raise a glass to Zebra. <laughs> like, oh my God, can they do that? I mean. I don't, I don't even know if, like, that's bizarre. I don't think I've ever really heard that. I don't even know if he was even, even in on it. They just kind of were like, well, it's a big brain series, so I'll just uh, slap his name on there and uh, let's move forward. <laughs> but, you know, wasn't there, um, do you remember all that stuff? I think it was BMI. Did you ever see all that stuff? Uh, probably, maybe, maybe. I, don't I know. believe it was called BMI. I could be wrong, but there were... If you go through enough paperback swap shops, you start coming across these books that you're like, I thought this was a zebra book. And instead it has no barcode on it. And it's from a publisher called like BMI. And what it was, was like Pinnacle, I believe, and Zebra in the late 80s and early 90s were publishing books through a fake front publisher oh that had God. no barcode on them so they wouldn't enter into a POS system. And basically, it was just so they wouldn't have to pay any royalties on them. That's insane. And, I, may have a couple, I may have a couple of those in my collection. Yeah, and it's like, holy cow. I mean, Brian <laughs> Keene's the one who sort of brought this to light. And it's like, are you kidding? That's someone's – your publisher – is pirating your books like yes. so of course they put gary bradner's name on something like that's the why not their sins <laughs> oh my god that's incredible good stuff i mean it's amazing the the ballsiness of it right i mean i hate yeah. to enter it but the pure ballsiness <laughs> of doing something like that I, i'm sort of in awe
Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Couldn't get away with that now, I don't think. I think, think uh, I feel like just because, now. yeah, just because there's fewer books out there. You know what I mean? Like, back right. then, it's yeah. like, this book will sell 30,000 units, and I've got 50 other books on my list that are doing yeah. 70, 80,000 each. Like, it'll just get lost in the shuffle. Chuck them into truck stops and, and whatever. Yeah, you know, exactly. The, the, the paperback rack. We'll yeah. do a little mail order with these. We'll do some, yeah, we'll do yeah, some yeah. drug stores in Montana. Yeah, totally. They'll sell. <laughs> All right, Grady, I gotta I gotta start wrapping up here. Yes, uh, yes. But uh, thank you so much for spending the time with me and, and chatting about these books. Um, I wanted to give you some time to kind of let people know what your latest release is, where people can find it, um, what you got going on. I know you were going to be doing some sort of tour thing, but of course, we're all stuck at home. Um, so what's what's going on with you these days? Well, so yeah, so like a lot of people, I think all these authors were calling ourselves uh, class of spring 2020. Uh, <laughs> I've got a book coming out that, you know, the tour's not going to happen until later this mm -hmm. year, hopefully. Uh, but it's a vampire book coming out um, from Quirk. Uh, it's called uh, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. It comes out on April 7th. Um, and, you know, one of the things that kills me um, is I was going to do a lot of touring at, at small bookstores. Like, I got mm -hmm. no problem with Amazon. I sell books through Amazon. I sell a lot of books through Amazon. They're great. I order a lot of stuff from Amazon. They're great. But independent bookstores, like, we we live in a world big enough for both. Independent bookstores yeah. and Amazon. And I know that there are, there are a lot of indie bookstores right now that are hurting. I mean, the places I was going to be touring, listen, they weren't relying on me to bring home the bacon, but it was <laughs> me and five other authors that month and six other the next right. month and all their walk-in business. And they're shut for the most part right now. And a lot of them may not come back. And so if yeah. you're going to pre-order Southern Book Club – uh, do it from your local bookstore. A lot of them use this um, platform called bookshop.org where it gives them, it's like, it's almost like Amazon for indie bookstores. They get an affiliate fee and all this, but someone else does the fulfillment. Um, okay. But, and I, and I know when you go through your indie bookstore, your local bookstore, you're paying four or five bucks more than you would on Amazon. But think of it as like putting something in the tip jar because yeah. what these stores offer, they know you. And they, they know your name. They know who you are. Right now, my mom is in South Carolina. And, you know, she's had lung disease for most of her life. And so she's really got to totally self-isolate right now and, and can't leave. And she's left her credit card at the local bookstore. And every week, they bring her three books. And they leave them on the front. Wow. No one else would do that. And, no. and it's nice for her to see them. I mean, she doesn't open the door, but she says, hi, <laughs> it's someone checking up on my mom that I know. And, you know, right now, I think sort of knowing people's names and having that bit of community, it's important. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if it's not my book, make it someone else's. But the best thing you can do for an author and the best thing you can do for your local bookstore is just pre-order something. It really, it's even better than buying it once it's out. Just pre-order it. It does a huge amount. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a, if you got the spare 25 bucks, do it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to read the Southern Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Um, oh, yeah. Email me your address. I'll send you a copy. I've got I've got I was going to do an event here and I in New York and I have a bunch of copies sitting in my house that aren't <laughs> going anywhere. So email me your okay. address. I'll mail you one. Uh, twist my arm and, and and I'll see what I can do about getting on Blackstone's roster so I can narrate some of your books in the future. I, yeah, that seems dude. like what I have to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to be bugging them soon, actually. But I just this year I had too much stuff going with but i also think it's amazing people. you're doing all this indie stuff like you're doing the william shoal books i think that's great yeah. i i love it and that, that's the thing with at this point in my career i want to absolutely love what i'm reading sometimes it's a hit or miss sometimes sure you know i'll take it i'll take a job and i'm like oh dang it the first chapter was amazing and now but overall it's a good book you know but um but yeah i, I want to find stuff that are, that's fun and with my sensibilities with you know with my love of 80s horror and stuff like that shoot if i can grab some you know some things and and if they're open to be, to have me narrate them and bring them back out into the into the public you know i'm all for it yeah. so um 
you know, it's always yeah. fascinating to me. Did, did Clive Barker, does Clive Barker have audiobooks out there right now? I think so. He does a, a lot of his books are with Crossroad Press. Oh, so really? a lot of the stuff wow. with okay. Crossroad Press. Huh. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of stuff's over there. So, yeah. so um, I've got to ask you, how long does it take? Like on average, if you had to average out how many hours <laughs> it takes to narrate a book? I have like a whole thing that I actually, um, a narrator friend of mine, Kyle Tate, made this little thing that has, uh, puts all the hours that goes into it. But I would say, uh, just for just throw things out there, be average. Um, say there's a ten hour finished book, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's thirty chapters. If you're gonna listen to it, it's a ten hour book. Um, I would say at least at least forty hours of work went into that. Holy ten hours, cow. at least forty to sixty, Ugh. depending on. Depending on, you know, I'm still I'm still pretty new, so it does take me longer because I have to stop more because I get tongue tied quicker and then then like a seasoned narrator. But um, and then you got the editing, proofing. I hire I hire a proofer. Um, depending on the contract, I'll either edit it myself, which is more time, or if I can pay for an editor, I will do that. So it's it's all this different moving parts that go into it. Like a company like Blackstone. Um, I would love to do stuff for them because I just got to narrate it. They handle it all the post production. Oh, um, got it. I so, didn't realize you were responsible so, for that stuff yourself. So me as like an independent narrator, um, getting contracts through like ACX, more independent stuff. Yeah, it's more is on my shoulder. So I'll either either the author can pay, and I'll roll in the the proofing fees into my fee, mm -hmm. um, or we'll work out some sort of royalty share. But royalty share is kind of upside down because um. Because uh, Audible, Amazon, ACX decided, or they, they they may have fixed a glitch. They were paying narrators um, royalties on the promo codes, and they're giving they were giving the narrators like a hundred promo codes for US and a hundred for UK. So two hundred promo codes. Good say, God, you know. Do the math on like you know three dollar, two to three dollars royalties. Yeah, you know per one. I mean. So I think they fixed the glitch. So, right. but I was kind of using that to make a straight royalty share deal make sense with my production costs. So now I'm, we're kind of recalibrating things, but you know, they fixed the glitch and uh, a lot of people who were relying on that, which you never should <laughs> rely on promo codes for your income. Uh, a lot of people were up in the, up in arms and I just kind of pivoted and I had to kind of move my calendar around. I had some straight royalty share stuff that I'm pushing out a bit so I can get some paid stuff in to kind of, you know, keep the money in the bank and flowing through. But I, I love it, man. This is, it's good stuff and uh, I'm having fun with it. And, you know, hopefully someday I, I can do this yeah. full time. I'm just my still trying to wrap rare. my head around 40 hours. That's crazy. Yeah. It's, you're chipping away. And that's the thing. Um, I always tell people, always ask me, I need some extra income. Should I narrate, can I narrate a book? I'm like, you don't, you don't understand what goes into it. It's, you're going to lose money or break even the first three years at least. There's a lot to learn to, to do it yourself. Yeah. You know, so, you know, uh, I always tell people like, I'm here to help, but it's not, it's not a quick, easy money thing. <laughs> like right now, a lot of people are looking for, what can I do from home? Maybe I'll narrate books. Look, uh, I say this almost every show, go to narratorsroadmap.com. There's a ton of stuff there. And, and she'll steer you in the right direction, but it's not for everybody. So, uh, I could talk about this stuff all day long, Grady, but I got to wrap up yep, um, absolutely. here, but again, thank you for, for joining me. And I would love to talk uh, again sometime about, about, yep. you know, thanks I'm for sure doing we, it, man. I'm sure we can, we can fill an hour pretty easily. So, uh, we'll talk again very soon. Effort. All right. <laughs> Take care, man. Thanks, Grady. Stay safe.